Welcome and good morning uh, to the IoT evolution. I've been coming to this for 16 years in a row, going back to Austin in 2011. And to those new faces here, welcome, and to those familiar faces, welcome back. I have the opportunity today to address uh, something that's near and dear to Cradle Point's heart, and it's, it's about developing strategic networking and security uh, considerations or recommendations for those distributed enterprises who are deploying IoT. And as we all know, IoT is a market of markets, and each market has, each has their own applications and use cases. And in this business, there is no one size fits all for all markets and all applications, all use cases. So the reason I'm bringing this up is it's important to put in context uh, the market that I'm talking about, which is distributed enterprise. So to some, IoT does mean home automation. To others, it means the connected car, the autonomous vehicle. And yet to others, they're, they're targeted, specific and targeted industrial applications uh, that are focused on a specific problem. To many of us, including us at Cradle Point, it's about businesses who make their living at the edge. These are distributed enterprises with locations that are fixed, mobile, temporary in some cases, in some cases transient. And they tend at each location to have a mix of devices. Uh, some of them are traditional, whether it's a PC or a laptop or a tablet, but some of them are IoT. So we're talking temperature sensors, digital signage, surveillance cameras, other, other IoT devices. And at the edge, the requirements on the local side from a networking standpoint to connect that edge the local side requires a lot of flexibility. You have some devices that are high power, some that are high require high bandwidth like cameras, but you also have low power devices, in some cases low bandwidth devices attached. So on the local side, you need that flexibility to address a variety of devices. But in our market, which is connecting the edge, the WAN needs to be built for speed because you need to look at all of the applications that are attached to that and make sure that your WAN side has the speed to handle that. And so when I talk, again, as I talk about our specific market, uh, that's an important context because we do need that speed. You cannot do a Windows upgrade of an embedded computer over an SMS-based uh, technology. It's just not possible. An example of a, one of our distributed enterprises, and it's interesting, they're not about revenue, but they're interested in using IoT as a competitive advantage against the bad guys. And in this case, this is the police car of the future, which in many markets is here today. They have, a, again, a blend of traditional devices, like a ruggedized laptop, officer's tablet, but also a blend of IoT devices. They have body-worn cameras, dash cameras, for those of you like me that watch NCIS, you see that fingerprint identification system that needs to be networked so it can identify the perp or the body. You also have uh, IoT sensors. If you pull the shotgun out of the rack, they want to know that event. That's an important event to most police departments. They want an alert to go up to the operations center so that they can go see what's going on. Look in the cameras. Do I need to send backup? There are sensors that determine are the sirens on, accelerometer sensors, so that if there's an unusual sudden stop or unnatural sudden stop, that they can basically look in the cameras or see what's going on, possibly send backup. So this is an example of not a physical location, not a fixed location, but a mobile location that has the same requirements as a lot of the fixed locations. So Cradle Point wanted, since we're in the business of um, providing solutions to distributed enterprises and specifically to the IT departments within those enterprises, we wanted to better understand their views on IoT. And so who else to pick? We, pick, we picked Spiceworks, which is famous in the IT world, to, and we commissioned a study for them to survey IT professionals at companies that were bigger than 500 across the US, Canada, and UK. And specifically, it's interesting here because if you think about people who adopt IoT solutions, there's really three groups. You have IT departments, and they're typically not making or creating IoT. They're implementing IoT solutions on the behalf of another department that made a request. 
But they're also, so that's IT. Then you have OT. And OT is all about implementing IoT in a way that improves their processes. And then you have R&D teams that are usually part of a product or service that's sold. And these R&D teams are baking IoT into the products and services that they sell to make them better. But this is important. We, we surveyed IT professionals. And while they're not creating IT projects, it's IoT projects, they own the enterprise network. And they're good consultants. If you're OT or you're another department that wants to implement IoT on your enterprise network, uh, you need to view the IT department as at least consultants. But you also need to recognize that they're gatekeepers as well. If they don't like what they see, they'll shut it down. And no matter how much work you put into that, um, and we've seen companies, examples of companies where you know, they developed something on a Raspberry Pi and thought they could deploy it across 50,000 locations, and IT started asking a lot of questions about security networking, and it got shut down. So without further ado, let's see what the IT departments have to say about IoT. So first, the, uh, it was really encouraging to see that IT departments are optimistic about IoT. If you look at adoption, 32% of them say that they have already implemented IoT solutions on their networks. And another 37% say that they plan to within the coming year. So that means that 69% of IT departments at these enterprises that we surveyed are actively involved today in IoT. And that's a good sign. We didn't tell them what IoT was. They, this is self-definition. But, but uh, I think most people, when you think about your IT departments, I think most of, it, most of us feel that they would be in the 8% which is wait as long as possible. But anyway, the survey does show that they're very actively involved. And as you go back to your enterprises, be worth the conversation. They might be deploying things on there that you had no idea that they were deploying. We also asked these IT folks, um, what are your biggest uh, concerns? And I'm sure you guys are shocked to see that security is number one. I mean, this is obviously what we talk about at every conference. And I'm going to go into a lot of the details on that. But a close second was cost, and specifically ROI. And these enterprises really want to make sure that if I'm going to the trouble to deploy these solutions on my network, I want to make sure that there's value that comes out of that. that and then if you go beyond that, and this survey is available on our website. Anybody that wants to download this survey, uh, feel free to visit cradlepoint.com and download it. It's called the State of IoT 2018 Report. But if you look at the beyond those top two, it's a long tail of other reasons. And we picked out three of them, reliable connectivity, lack of internal expertise, and, and legacy network infrastructure. So those are the concerns. But obviously, if 69% of them are implementing IoT, they're basically sending the message that despite those concerns, the enterprise feels that there's enough benefit and enough return and enough competitive advantage gained to take those risks and install it. So I want to use, I'm going to spend the next few slides addressing recommendations and considerations that address these top three, security, cost, and the reliable connectivity. So first, let's talk about security. The internet was designed and constructed on the notion of Connect first, authenticate second. Hackers love this. This is the view that a hacker sees when they scan the network. They see all sorts of devices on the network. And they're able to scan the network, identify those devices, find the ones they want. And then they have automated toolkits that they can point at these devices to crack the authentication. And it may be hard. I mean, the simple stuff is, did they change the default password? Oftentimes, no. That's easy to crack. But there are known vulnerabilities in a lot of standard IT, IoT devices that they're able to hack. And it seems some of those might be that hard. But for a hacker, they're not, because the toolkit does all the work. You just, as a hacker, need to know where to point it. That's why you see 14-year-olds that have pulled off some great hacks in this world. But the idea is that. When you have, if you think about the Mariah attack, this is one of the, the, the biggest deals in IoT hacking. 
So someone was able, and we know who they are now, they've been arrested, there were a couple people from Rutgers, sorry if any of you are from Rutgers, but they launched this attack that identified IP cameras and some other equipment, routers, other consumer, but mostly cameras, and their hacking tool just went through the standard password, default password, who changes the IP address on your IP camera, or your, your password, um, and they were able to log into the camera and put malware on there. And the malware was brilliant. It was a contagious malware that was able to spread to other devices. And they masked up a botnet of, I think, nearly 800,000 devices. And then to see where they could point it, the first one they went after was Brian Krebs, the famous security consultant in the industry, and took down his website. And then a month later, they went after Dyn, Dyn DNS. And that one hurt us a little bit more because Dyn was the foundation for services at Netflix, Twitter, Airbnb, GitHub if you're a developer. So it, it really affected, this is about a year ago, and it really opened up a lot of eyes about the risks of IoT devices on an enterprise network. Now, if you're an IT professional at an enterprise and your IP got hacked and was used to launch an external attack, you'd be embarrassed. But on the other hand, if that same camera was used by a hacker to compromise that camera and use it to penetrate further into your enterprise network and steal enterprise data, you're likely gonna be fired. And the IT guys are on the front line of this daily battle. They are literally standing up against the neutral zone. Hackers trying to get in. Their jobs are on the line. They're doing the best they can. And in the traditional world, they have a lot of tools that they can deploy. On a laptop, I could put Trend Micro, Kaspersky. I have all sorts of other tools I can put on my laptop or traditional devices that have been developed. But when it comes to IoT devices, there is no, like I said earlier, there is no one size fits all. IoT devices uh, vary widely in terms of their processing power, memory, operating system. Some of them are closed, some of them are open. It really uh, is a struggle. So what I'm gonna talk about next is something called software-defined perimeter. And if you're a hacker and you're looking at a software-defined perimeter, a solution that's been built on that, this is what you see. If you can't see it, you can't hack it. And the notion is to create private networks that are completely isolated and hidden to the outside world using what's called a host-based architecture. So what is a host-based architecture? It's where a device or an application hosts a client. And remember how I said the internet was based around connect first, authenticate second? This client is used to authenticate first before you see the network. So you cannot see the network until that client authenticates you, whether you're a person, whether you're a device, whether you're an application. And once you're authenticated, now you can go into that network. And the reason IT departments like using this for IoT, for IoT applications is they really don't know what's on that camera or what it's capable of or who has developed hacks for it. So it, it enables them to put it on a dark cloud, a private network that is completely isolated from other enterprise assets and is invisible to the outside world. So how does that work? If on the inside, and, and uh, you can think of this as having a data plane and a control plane with a bunch of points of presence, but simply in the middle, there's a controller. And if you have, in this case, a manufacturing site and you have sensors attached to that gateway that you want to connect to an application, the controller is in charge of working with that client to authenticate, in this case, that gateway, and potentially the devices attached to the gateway and then authenticate the application itself via the cloud, the client that resolves in that, uh, or resides in that application. And then once you're on there, create a segment where those sensors and the gateway can talk to the applications. Separately, if you have a mobile site or other, you can bring that on the same network. So that, that yellow segment is an example of one segment. This is called micro-segmentation. <clears throat> if I want to overlay the network, so I want to leverage my existing network and add kiosks to it, and add applications for those kiosks that only the kiosk can see. You can see I created another micro segment in red. And then third, on a camera-based solution, if you have 
uh, cameras, you have a, some sort of DVR or server, and then you have a mobile app to look at those cameras, you can create a third network for that. Now, people that have been in the networking world, and a lot of us have been in there for you know, 20 or 30 years, my first job was for, two, for, I was working for two kids that ended up being two of the four technical founders of Cisco. I didn't even know that. So that's how far I go back in networking. But in the, basically the old school of doing this today, you need a lot of static IPs, you need IPsec VPN tunnels, you need a VPN concentrator, you need to understand how to speak VLAN. For the most part, you're gonna have a Cisco CCIE who's a very talented person that really knows how to do this via command line interface. That's the old school way of doing it. If you're standing up a network quickly, this is a very, very easy way to put those onto a private network. We had one of our customers in Texas, and I won't say which city, might have been Dallas, they were very happy to be in implementing security cameras at their traffic intersections. And we went on, we have people that scour the dark web and found some of those traffic cameras on the dark web. We called them up and said, you've got to lock this down. They said, well, the VPN stuff is really complicated. We're just trying to do a proof of concept and get this rolled out first. Well, ever since then, when I was talking in New York, they were doing some same thing, traffic analytics. The recommendation always is the same. It's very easy to create these private networks and you don't have to worry about static SIMs, VPN, tunnels, etc. That's software defined perimeter. An example of a customer that's using this is DSC Dredge. And these folks are world class leaders in developing dredge equipment. And one of the things that makes them world-class leaders is in addition to developing good equipment, and by the way, for those of you from Florida, that white stuff is snow. Um, but they also, uh, as part of their customers, they want the customers to have up-to-date, accurate information of where they are. You know, what's going on on the dredger, what's going on in terms of how much has been pulled, where's the project at? So as part of this solution that they sell, it also includes real-time sensors and array of information that they can use to pull that information and prepare reports for the end customer that hired the dredge to, to show in real time. And it's important, the, the, they used to use IPsec VPN tunnels. They would have to have a technician at the dredge and another one at the data center to get this up and running and connected. And if they ever had a problem, they'd have to put someone on a plane to go fix it. One of the dredges, dredgers was in Nigeria. And so in the US, we talk about the cost of a truck roll at a retail store, maybe $600. The cost of a plane roll for them going to Nigeria was very, very high, plus uh, the associated downtime with, with having that down. And they migrated to a software-defined perimeter solution that has all but eliminated those plane rides. This is, uh, going back to the police car example, and I talked about the top IoT secure, uh, concerns being security, cost, and reliability. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about reliability. And I know some of you are thinking, is Ken putting up an SD-WAN slide at an IoT conference? And the answer is yes. <laughs> and the reason is a lot of our IT departments go through a thought process per application do I stand up a separate network for this IoT device or do I put it on my existing network? One of our banking customers wanted to roll out digital signage to all 2,200 of their branch locations and they said, we don't want that on our financial network. We don't want that going through our data center. So they stood it up on a separate network. That's where 4G is very good uh, to be able to quickly do that. Put it on a separate network. But if you look at the different applications that IT departments are being asked to do, they're not gonna put all of them on a separate network. You need to overlay it over the top of your existing network. And one of the things, that big trend that's going on in branch right now is the notion of SD-WAN, where you have multiple WANs and you make application specific policies over which WAN you use for the connection. And in many cases, this dramatically improves the reliability. We had one customer that said that with their normal internet access, and they had 18,000 locations, this is a branch office customer, their availability was 98.5%. Sounds pretty good, 1.5% downtime. But at any given, point, at any given point, their IT department had to deal with 200 or 300 or 400 locations that didn't have internet access. And they had cloud-based applications. I want to take a policy. I want to look up 
uh, I want to take an application, look up a policy, process a claim. And when those sites were down, they couldn't do it. When they added multiple internet connections and had that redundancy, they were able to get their uptime to 99.98%. It's almost four nines using consumer technologies. So SD-WAN is an important component for people that are rolling out IoT applications that need to be reliable. It is an important component. Now what's interesting is I'm not showing you a branch office, I'm showing you a police car. SD-WAN applies to police cars, M2M -M devices. We have one company that does delivery lockers for one of the big online retailers. And they want to know if you've ever ordered something from this company, you always get an alert within seconds after your package was dropped off. And so for delivery lockers, they wanted to put those in areas where people could go pick up their deliveries at their convenience. They want multiple carriers. They wanted two modems, one pointed at one carrier, one pointed at the other for redundancy. It's all wireless, but it's still redundancy. In the police car, we're heavily involved in FirstNet. And uh, in some of the early trials of FirstNet, we have our FirstNet modem, we have the regular commercial LT modem. But these police cars are recording a lot of video in the DVR, in the trunk, or as they say in the UK, in the boot. And they still want to archive that video. So when they pull into the police yard, the police car automatically attaches to the access point that's in the yard using Wi-Fi as WAN. Again, here's a specific policy based. I want this application policy to use Wi-Fi because it's cheaper to transmit that video up to the archives than 4G. And so that's an example of SD-WAN uh, to help improve reliability at some of these locations. So, and Perry Lee, you're, could you stand real quick? I know you probably hate this, but um, Perry Lee is with Cradlepoint and he's our technical director for IoT. So he's really running our whole strategy. Uh, he's got a lot of folks underneath him, but his book called IoT for Architects was just published yesterday. And I just ordered it on Amazon. It'll be back on my desk before I get back to the office. But Perry has gone through a lot of different information sources. And he'll be here all week if anyone wants to talk to him. Uh, but one of the most interesting things, and we took his logarithmic graph and converted it to something a little bit more dramatic. But essentially, if you look at the amount of data being generated at the edge and the ability of the network to process it, the amount of data is growing exponentially faster uh, than the ability of the network to, to process it. And it's really pushing all of us that live at the edge to look at edge computing and to really embrace that. And we can talk about um, some of the strategies that we do there, but really what we're seeing is routers at the edge that might have used to be gateways today need the compute to be able to analyze that data potentially doing machine learning at the edge so that you're not transmitting all of that data up to the top. When I was in New York uh, with New York Transit, they had some cameras pointed at, they were doing a proof of concept along 7th Avenue, and they were able to, they didn't want to send the video up, they just wanted to send the metadata. It was a perfect example of edge computing. So they were able, able to identify, is this a bus, is this a truck, is it a car, is it a bike? and then uh, transmit the information for that. It's pretty impressive. Uh, another example, and I'll use this to illustrate the different, uh, basically the other element of it, uh, which is the cost element. San Antonio had traffic intersections, 1,400 traffic intersections, and they used an RF mesh network to connect it that wasn't really working. They only had 60% of their traffic intersections that were connected at any given point. And if you're trying to do traffic analytics, things like that, that's not good. And uh, so this is an example of the concern that I expressed earlier in the survey that came out about reliability. Uh, by switching to an LTE-based solution, uh, they were able to get from 60% to nearly 100%. They had a target of 95, but they were able to do that. And if you think about, again, I talked about locations having multiple applications. Traffic intersections, it's amazing all the things they can hang off of poles. You have the uh, traffic light controller, you have traffic cameras, you have sensors that are sniffing MAC addresses of Wi-Fi smartphones uh, for crowd analytics, a lot of interesting applications there. So finally, uh, the other, and I should say, part of our, our three strategic pillars for addressing distributed enterprises and their edge applications are wireless, 
So today it's 4G. At the end of the year, it'll be gigabit LTE uh, coming on 5G. The second pillar is software-defined networking. And I've talked about two cases of that, software-defined parameter, software-defined WAN. And then the third element is IoT enablement. And I touched on that a little bit. But on the 5G side, there's a lot of native capabilities built into 5G that I think are going to be very, very interesting for IoT. It's a high-speed network. But it also supports low power, low speed modes. It supports network slicing. So I think going back to that cow video or the cow slide, uh, there's the ability to have industry specific devices connected directly to the network. But from our standpoint, based on the enterprise edge that we're talking about with the need for speed, uh, we feel that this really opens up a lot more bandwidth at a much more affordable price for us to use. And my favorite quote was when one of the top US carriers, they said that they're, they're stopping their fiber rollout. And their number one use case for 5G is residential internet. So think kids in the basement watching Netflix. That's the bandwidth that they think they're going to have at the, uh, you know, the affordability for consumers. And we think that that's going to be fantastic for enterprises. So in summary, I talked about uh, today software-defined perimeter software-defined WAN or SD-WAN, edge computing, and 5G for IoT. And in the space of about 30 minutes, that's probably a good start. But if you'd like to learn more, uh, we'd be happy to talk to you in person at our booth at 801. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time.